from Pitino the camera, and that's the whole second movement. Thank you. 
Great, really excellent job. Um, what is your name? Uh, Ismail. Ismail? Yeah. Ismail? My name is Dr. PK. <laughs> um, nice to meet you. Um, so, how did you feel about that, about what you just played? Uh, I thought it went okay. There's some spots where I kind of bugged a little bit. Mm -hmm. Couple spots that, and that happens, you know, that's live performance. And I, I personally felt like you played really, really, really well, really strongly. I felt like your um, playing really shined, but the biggest thing, I think from the first moment that you walked out, it was a good, it was a good um, execution, good ideas, but it wasn't a complete performance. So what is the first sound that people hear right before you play? Breathing, right? So from that very first breath, and even from before the breath, um, so this is actually a trick question. What's the very first thing that people hear before you play? Before you play, when you walk down? Uh, I will remind you. So, uh, <laughs> right, right? So you walked out, and what do you do when people are clapping? We bow. we bow, right? So I'll give you one more shot at this. So what I want you to do is, people are going to start judging you. B before they hear you play the saxophone, based on how you walk, based on how you speak, based on how you interact with an audience. It's a two-way street, right? It's not, you're not in a practice room. Yeah. <laughs> I know sometimes we all wish we were in practice rooms, but um, so <laughs> maybe that's just me. Um, but when you walk out, I want you to own the stage, right? So walk quickly. You're going to acknowledge that everyone's here. You're going to bow, right? And then you're going to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Ismael. I'm going to be performing Eber Concertina the Camera. All right, here we go. Give us one more try. One more try right from the beginning. So walk off stage, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody clap. <laughs> there you go. Quickly. Quickly. <laughs> good, 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 good. And is is this your is this your audience? No, okay. Can you can you bow towards us instead of bowing to the thank you, Ebear, for this music? No. <laughs> try try one more time. Um, and when you bow, actually, can you sit in the audience? Here we go. I'm gonna play Ebear with no saxophone. <laughs> All right. Everyone clap. Your turn. Can I do it again? Yes. <laughs> this is important. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, and I, and I love the smile. I can tell you're having fun. <laughs> and we're having fun. Um, See, so and that's the big thing. And then when you speak, I would, did you rehearse what you were going to say today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's always, so when you're in a situation like that, always prepare for everything, okay. right? And I think in general, in a master class, it's generally okay to speak. Um, it's, you know, it's your master class, so you can treat this like a performance, um, and then I'm just here to kind of steer you in the right direction, because you've done a lot of the work already, and it's really, really excellent, so we can actually dive in now into some of the playing, but keep in mind that it's not just how you play, that's the performance, it's the whole show, right? Yeah. All right. Um, 
Can we talk first about your character for this piece? How would you describe what you want to come out? Like what, if you, you know, give me some adjectives about this second movement. For the first movement? Yeah, the first part. Yeah, usually we'll just call this the second movement for ease, and then we'll call this the third movement. Okay. Technically, there's only two movements, but you, we, we all know. All saxophonists know. That's the third movement. So second movement, tell me what your character is. Like, what are you going for? I mean, for this, the way, I mean, the first time I played this, mm -hmm. I thought this as um, just to be, like, kind of gloomy. Gloomy? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just sound like gloomy. Yeah. yeah. So did you feel like that was, that came across in your playing? Uh, at least only this first half of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would agree. I think I got that. I really had to listen. So can you try and make it more obvious what you're trying to do with your character? So you're, you're going for gloomy. Can we try this, right? Try this beginning. And then when you play that second iteration, be da, be da, make it spooky. Take your time. person like that a lot better. This intro was so much more dramatic. Um, and one other thing, I'm going to keep coming back to this, because I, like I said, I love your saxophone playing. You have a great sound. I love your vibrato. I love a lot of decisions you make musically. Um, but it's not the whole performance. So try that beginning one more time. And can you show us Gloomy? Okay. Question. <laughs> What did you do right before you played with your eyes? Yeah. Did you look around though? Yeah, you, you looked up and it's like, I'm gloomy, but also I'm looking at everybody judging me, right? And so, so it's your eyes, your eyes tell a big story. So what I would do is maybe try closing your eyes, you know, or be more introspective. Like if you want to be gloomy, if you want to be like introspective and meditative, almost like kind of insular, I would show that too, okay. right? Try one more time. And <laughs> this, is, this is difficult. All right, I'm going to watch. Stand still, perfectly still. Don't move. Don't move. Yeah, and just from those two notes, does that feel different? See everybody nodding their head? Yeah. So, <laughs> pro tip, it's, <laughs> you play so well, and now it's like putting the whole thing together, right? That you're a performer. You're not just a saxophonist or a musician. You're a performer. Um, all right, next thing. We can talk about some actual, like, saxophony stuff now. Um, can I hear this interval? <laughs> Let's start uh, from 24. Good. Yeah, you hear that? Do you know why that's, do you know why that's happening? Yes, it's, so it's a figuring issue. I think you're, some people will uh, say that's a voicing thing, like, oh, you're not voicing it correctly. I'm almost 100% sure that it is a finger issue. So try this. Can you put a... Um, G natural in there. B yodel. From yeah. Good. And can you make that G a grace note? Mi bro. Good. Now can you think that and put that in this line? Ba da 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 ba da da. It's okay if I hear it. Mm, yeah. Try it one more time. Yes, can you try one more thing? Can you play a middle D and trill your G-sharp key? Okay, I was checking if it was leaking. It's not leaking. Um, so it's just you. <laughs> try, try, try one more time, same thing. Mm -hmm. Good. Can, can we try it once where um, you actually go B, A, D, do like a scale down? B, L, O. -L. 
Yeah, no, no G sharp in that scale. Can I hear? Uh, yes, that's what I want to hear. One more time. So, mm -hmm. Can I hear a C major scale starting on B, ending on D? Good. Can you get it faster? And can you keep your air moving all the way through that? There we go. And even faster if you can. Can we get B, 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 and then loop that? Faster. Even faster if you can. Good. Can I hear B, as fast as you can to get down to that D? Good. Not with your air. Just Yes, that. Perfect. One more time. Good. Keep going. <laughs> I just want, want to keep it. There we go. Keep the air going. Keep the air going. Good. So the reason that we're doing this is to train our fingers. The reason that interval doesn't speak is because one of your fingers is late in, in the order. So if we think about going from B to D, going this, and something's happening. If I was doing this in slow motion, really exaggerated, it'd be like something like this is happening. So when we when we trick our mind, basically, to put that scale down, can you try this in context and think? Actually, just try the... Um, and as quick as you can. Yeah, I still want to hear the... Yep. Can we try that in context now? And if, even if I still hear that, that's okay. Because this is how we get rid of the, the like slight finger timing issues that creates that sound. <laughs> Every saxophone is favorite. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so even, and you actually did, you jumped a step. Because I would, if I was practicing, I would still do the B-L-E-L until I got tired of it and quit the saxophone. <laughs> but no, I would do it like ad nauseum. And then like maybe a couple weeks before the concert, then that's when you can think that, and then what will happen is basically you just trick your fingers into moving in the right order um, so that you avoid the, you know. <laughs> God, I love that sound, honestly. It's great. Um, okay, next thing. Rhythm. Yes. We tell me, um, there's some choices that you made that I really liked, and there's some choices that I had some questions about. Not that I didn't like them, but I was wondering, so you held on to certain notes in certain places? Yeah. Yeah, like you held on to the body, oh, e, oh, you really, really lingered. Um, why? For this? Yeah, for that one. I think that one in particular, that one stood out to me as being like a little out of, out of the character you described, like gloomy. Oh, it's because I like listening to recordings. So oh. <laughs> one of the recordings I really liked was Arnold Bornkamp's recording of it. Yes. And he switches it so often. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, our, <laughs> he is dramatic, and I, I appreciate the drama because this piece is dramatic, but is his recording where you got the idea of Gloomy from? Yes. Okay. I think then if you wanted to play that much, there has to be more, um, you have to convince me of it. Because right now when, I also I really like that recording, I met Arno once, he's awesome, <laughs> he's a big fan. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is, uh, a copy of a copy, right? Because, I mean, Arno probably got that from somewhere. He might have listened to some other string recording, and then you're listening to Arno, and then it's kind of like, it's, something's lost in translation, so it's not quite working for me in terms of that character of Gloomy. So let's go from... Um, no, let's just go back to the beginning and see what you can do. So what, what will make this work is elsewhere in here, see if you can prepare us for that moment. All right, so don't let this be the first moment that we hear. Do -di -o -di -o. All right. Let's try it. Freeze. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you, you conduct yourself. Like, <laughs> no need. Gloomy. Lots of vibrato, vibrato. Yes. Big here. More, more. Big, big, big. Vibrato.
Yeah. That worked. How did that feel? Did that feel different at all? Yeah. Yeah. It felt a lot different. There's only one moment when I gasped. <laughs> right? Do you know why I gasped? So. You have a guess? Because everything was so, it was, I was so into it. You had me eating out of the palm of your hand, and there's one thing that was like, ah! <gasps> <laughs> the breathing spot? Yes. Yeah, yeah that release. Yeah. I didn't feel like you quite ended it. Try, I'll give you another shot at it. So yeah, I think bigger here, I mean, it's a low B flat. Might as well make it pretty <laughs> instead of like quiet. Um, so try it from here. I think you're breathing here, right? Yeah. So breathe, start at the T sharp when you get to here. The most beautiful release. I don't want to know when that note stops. All right, there we go. Big. Homework. <laughs> Sorry, I messed you up. I tell you it's homework. Yeah, yeah. That beginning felt so much better. Does that feel better? Yeah. And that makes all the difference. All right. So this section, flawless. Love it. You'll, like I said, this yeah. is homework. <laughs> you'll, you'll figure that out. Um, I had some other things written. Oh, yes. 25. The other thing. Going back to this idea of a performance. When you play this, so this release I think was nice. This rest was not nice. Oh, yeah. Do you know, what did I hear in the rest? Do you know? Two, the beating was too loud or was it that there was enough of a rest? The, there was something that happened in the rest that pulled me out of it again. Because we're everything we were trying to do is like create this story, create this character, create a mood. Um, try and convey something, right? Anything that snaps me out of things, so you go, oh, he's playing saxophone, <laughs> you know, is, is something that's worth, like, looking at a little bit closer. So in this rest, I, it, it was, the movement doesn't bother me so much, but what I heard was, click, oh. ee, right? Like, in that rest, it was, it was a moment where we were, like, resting, and then you snap me out of it by going, Kick, by putting your fingers down, like, really, really loud. So see if you can... Um, Start from here. And then slowly press those keys for that F sharp so we don't, we don't notice that you're like playing the saxophone, <laughs> right? Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> you did it a couple more times. You, if you do it a couple more times, it'll be a piece of cake. Does that make a difference in terms of? feel different than how you played it before. Yeah. yeah, so for a second, you let your guard down on that rest. You're like, oh, finally I can breathe. No, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> yes, there is a physical breath, but a, a rhetorical breath, there is not, right? That music's still going, so still be in character, right? Um, how am I doing on time? Oh. Okay, uh, I think I had one more thing. And my score just left me. Hang on. Yes, last thing. What do you look at when you're performing? Like, in general? <laughs> in general, yes. Yeah, there's like a tier, you know, like you probably spend like 95% of the time looking at the music. But that other 5%. Just at the audience? At the audience. When you look at an audience, are you looking at individual people? No. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> it, so, yeah. yeah, so it, it felt like that, and kind of like unwanted eye contact can be like very uncomfortable, <laughs> right? So what I would do is I'd actually recommend looking kind of off in the rhetorical distance, right? If you, especially if you want to go for that character of like, you know, something's ending, um, see how, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm like looking kind of not at anybody in particular, and no one feels like uncomfortable, like, oh, <laughs> right? No, <laughs> no one's spooked. Um, and I think closing your eyes is an option, too. That's something that I like to do. That's a habit that I know I have, um, sometimes maybe too much. <laughs> but like when I really am thinking and when I'm really like going for that moment of introspection, of, uh, I don't know, solemnness, I mean, it can be a lot of different things. You know this music. 
You know, you know, you could probably play this from memory if you tried. Like at least like eight or ninety percent of it, I think. So don't be afraid to to enjoy that moment. Um, you know, in public, it can be kind of vulnerable to be like standing here with your eyes closed. You know, but I, I encourage you for you specifically that you like to look around and like I I like that. But um, I think giving you some more options, basically, to, to interact with an audience, to interact with the music, to visually show us like what you've done so beautifully with your music. So uh, thank you so much. Okay. Ismail? Yeah. Hi, I'm Bob Eason. Hello. Nice to meet you. Okay, be you have a beautiful sound. I, you know, I think all the things that uh, Dr. PK was working on you with the, the opening of this is spot on, okay? I wanted to talk a little bit about the, you know, the, from 28 on, rehearsal 28 on. So why don't you take it from, from here one more time, and we won't get very far. I'll probably stop you around here. Okay, no, that's good. So when you're working on really technical things like this, how do you practice it? Slow it down and then speed it up gradually. Okay, what else? Uh, that's absolutely step one, right? Articulation. What about it? It's finding where to articulate from like Ah, so just paying really particular attention to the articulation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, with, with this piece in particular, and really anything we have that is kind of digital in nature, where we have you know, to move our fingers in these patterns in a, a really precise kind of way, I find that using practice rhythms are like the absolute best thing you can do in terms of like, you know, what you're spending your time on. Have you ever used any kind of practice rhythms or altered rhythms? Technically, yeah, it was on Crescent, and we would, I would do, we would do where uh, you kind of like swing it, and then we would reverse it. Like right. Reverse. Yeah, that's absolutely it. So I have, you know, really vivid memories of myself spending so much time on all these technical passages with that in mind. So if that's something that you haven't done with this, I would say absolutely do it. Um, a lot of this, you know, it's, it's like in D flat major with these like, you know, thirds and fourths and fifths and these awkward jumps up and down, you know, ta da 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 all these things. Altered rhythms or practice rhythms are gonna be your best friend, okay? Can we try that from right here at the beginning? So let's, let's do, you mentioned kind of the swing and then the inverted version of that. Let's do, uh, let's think about groups of two and we'll do the swing one, which is kind of a long, short, long, short, long. Beat on, beat on, beat on. So this is the eighth note. Okay, good. So what? So I think you can make a more clear articulation, um, just with the 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 clarity of the tongue and just a little bit more air pressure behind. So rather than ta, can you can you say? T -t okay, so try from here one more time. Tatiya or Da -di -ya -di -ya -di. Sorry, I sang the wrong one, so da 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 yi da yi da. Okay, but so now try to try to exaggerate and make it rather than a swing rhythm, make it more like a grace note. Ba bum be dum be um be um Mm, but ah, but the articulated notes are the oh. it's the right the G flat F E flat ta ti ya ta ta. Right. So trying to have all these you know really perfect details at these at the slow altered rhythms will make it so much kind of at your fingertips when you want to play what's written, right? So let's, um, let's just look at these two bars. These are kind of the most challenging, I think, in the opening. So let's start here. Okay, good. So I think we get the most out of this exercise if you push that short note as and compress it as much as you can. So, 
Pam pari para pari param. Mm, let's, just, let's just work out work on these two bars because that's kind of awkward with the time. Da dee ba dum da dum da dee da dee da da ba dee da da. Yeah, but I want you to keep your air really consistent. All right, the kind of natural thing is when we do any t anything like this, the air wants to like really do that that sh that that shorter note. But try to go boom ba dee ba dee ba dee ba and keep your air really smooth. Okay. Hmm, that's good. It still sounds kind of the the triply boom bobby, but remember boom buddy ba dum buddy ba dum. Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm talking about going boom buddy ba dum ba dum ba dum. That's the right the thing, but I want you to, to take that short note and just really so it's really more like a triple dotted, you know, eighth note followed by like a sixty fourth note. Bum badim badum badim badum. So try try saying bum badum 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 badum. You have to like wait on that long note a long time. Boom, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. So what we're trying to do with this exercise and why I keep trying to get Ismail to push that to like wait longer on that last note is because ultimately this goes really fast. And what we're trying to train our fingers to do is to move from note to note really quickly. And so even though our tempo is really slow, we still want to try to find the way that our fingers can go. Because when it goes, our fingers have to be able to move in that really precise, like agile way. Okay, so I'll spend just a few more minutes on it, but let's try from here one more time. I want I want you to say this. Try. Wait longer. Badim, badam. Aha. Oh. Right. Okay, that's, that's where I think you will make the most progress with technique writ large. It's being able to separate the, the tempo from the speed. Those are different things, right? Our fingers are almost always going to open and close the keys very, very fast. Like, if our fingers move slowly, we hear that in the sound. We hear the note go, da, you know, on, on some, like, you know, teeny tiny level, if we were to, like, zoom in really, really close to the audio, like, the sound of the key makes, like, the key closes, has a sound to it, right? And so, we want to move our fingers very fast from open to close and from close to open. So, let's try a the same kind of idea, but a totally different exercise. Let's go very slowly. Slow. Tempo. Very fast fingers. Okay. What I, what I want you to listen for is the a couple of things. The caveat to all of this is you want to you want to move your fingers as fast as possible, as late as possible, but with no key noise. Right? If we on the saxophone, if we if we put too much pressure behind our fingers, the saxophone makes a sound. Right? Can you give us a key uh, the sound of a key click? Yeah. And so, in some pieces, that's a whole thing into its own. In in this piece, we don't want to hear it at all. Right? So, one more time, very slowly. As fast as you can move your fingers with no key noise. Yeah, 
Yeah, beautiful. Now, with the articulation we have, these groups of two, da da ti da ta da ti da ta da ti da ta da ti da ta da ta da ta, bring out that. So a little bit more air pressure behind the tongue on ta da ti da ta da ti da ta. I think that's where the energy from this really comes from. Yeah, absolutely. So go back to the very beginning. Ta ti ya ti ya, and every articulation like that, bring out that slur two, slur two. Yeah, that sounds great. I think if you, for uh, I, I meant to ask earlier, how long have you been working on this piece? Uh, two months. Okay, honestly, man, that's a fantastic start. Two months on this piece. Gabe, how long have you been working on this piece? Ten years. At, at least, <laughs> at least for you know for for me easily we we never almost we never stop for really working on these things. Okay, so the clarity that you just played with is exactly how it pitches out. Okay, and I think the next step is just to really get in your ear what it sounds like to have the clarity of rhythm, the like the immediacy of the articulation, just like the sound of the airstream moving, and just apply that to everything, okay? That sounds great. I think if you can keep that, that standard as you work up the tempo, then it's gonna be just amazing, okay? Great job.
Hello. Hello. Uh, Reese, right? Yes. Pleasure, Reese. I'm Kyle. Nice to meet you, Kyle. Pleasure. And I'm sorry, the name is Evan? Pleasure to meet you, Evan. Wonderful playing from both of you. Uh, I love this piece. Uh, Debussy is always a joy to play, and it's always fun to kind of, uh, there's not an enormous amount of saxophone music written by Debussy, um, but there is a lot of sa uh, piano music written by Debussy, and so it's always a joy to kind of meld these two worlds together and see what awesome soundscapes that you can create together, which definitely leads to, again, what I want to address first, which is how wonderfully you two do play together and what wonderful soundscapes you did create. Um, uh, I'm interested to know, similar to what uh, we had asked previously as well, of how long have you been working on this piece? That's about 10 months now. About 10 months, um, which is a relatively substantial amount of time, but not an enormous amount of time in the sense of, for a lot of these pieces, we, it's a lifetime yeah. you know, study. I would say for 10 months' work, you are doing an absolute wonderful job of creating um, really interesting musical ideas. I think a lot of uh, your um, music ideas in terms of when phrases are ending and beginning are really interesting. And I think that, you know, continue to evolve those and continue to, you know, explore what this piece has to offer in regards to, you know, uh, statements of what you want to say with the piece. Speaking of which, um, have you two talked together about what you're trying to convey with this piece or what you are imagining when you're performing this piece together, whether it be as, the, as a whole or in specific moments in the piece itself, arrivals or idea changes? Not that we need to go through these right now, but have you guys had that conversation together? I'm not like speeding off without him, right? Sure. But as far as like overall landscape, I'm not sure we've had a super in-depth conversation about it. Um, yeah, gotcha. And that's the perfectly fine. Of course, it's an evolving process. And so it sounds um, like perhaps a lot of the conversation has been about like ensemble of like, you know, staying together and, um, you know, lining things up, which is, of course, always valuable. Um, I always love also having those conversations of the more abstract, of the more, you know, what are some of the more um, visual ideas that we're thinking here, and, you know, I'm thinking of this color here, or I'm thinking of this scene here, or I'm thinking of this memory here, and sharing that with each other, because it's very much um, a dialogue between the two of us here, very, not as much as, like, you know, he is accompanying you, and you are the soloist. This piece is very much a collaboration between the two. So uh, I always encourage you to have those conversations you know, in those rehearsals as well. Just curious if you had any thoughts right off the bat in terms of what are some of the um, images or imagery or colors or things that you tend to find yourself finding yourself in when you're playing this piece. Do you have any that kind of pop in your mind? This piece is very blue. Very blue, yeah. Very like, um, I think that piece just has a, a lot of blue music, very like watery, flowing mm -hmm. music. Um, yeah, I see a lot of like blue and splashes of yellow with this piece, and um, yeah, I think specifically it's like um, I see a lot of like almost like you're sitting at like a lake and there's like sun coming onto a pond and like the the sun bits are like the the high scales that go up and fill piece and I'm just like da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. it's like uh, that's kind of the atmosphere that comes to my mind personally. I don't know if you have different and that's beautiful and that's beautiful to hear and I think that the more that we think of these things as we're performing especially WC especially impressionist music right this music is very much written during a time where visual art is so big and it's changing and morphing from these more rigid structures to these more abstract ideas Right, and Debussy is such a wonderful showcase of that from not only his, you know, uh, more soundscapes that he does, but even the min minor things of like one of the, you know, big uses of the whole tone scale, which, you know, which wasn't as used back. And, and so it's just really interesting to explore that. And so I always like to, you know, in terms of the, before we dive into the more specific stuff, on the grander scale, I think any time that we perform any music, especially with an accompanist, is so important to have those conversations about 
what are we, where are we at in this music together? And how can we kind of go through that journey um, and show the audience musically where we're all going through this journey together as well? <clears throat> and so I continue to, you know, I encourage you to continue exploring those, um, those conversations. Um, awesome. Well, perhaps a good place to move towards is actually before, similar to as Gabe has started, to before the performance. Um, something that I think it can be really valuable before we play is to get a really nice, not only intonation-wise um, alignment with the piano, but also balance-wise. And so, can we get another tuning note just right, at, uh, right up front? Yeah, and so I know we're still kind of uh, finding it, but what I'm also more so of the internet, uh, less of the intonation I'm concerned about, or concern is the wrong word, is what I'm focusing on. What I am more focusing on is actually your blend with the piano. Rather than thinking of in tune, right? I would like, can, can we just hear an A, just a few, just kind of keep it ringing? And he's just gonna let it go for a while. And we're just going to, and, and it'll probably restart a few times. And I want you to just to put yourself in this A without even playing. You can close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to. But put yourself in this A. And when you're ready, it doesn't matter if it's in tune. I don't care if it's sharp or flat, whatever. I want you to move into the sound. Not A, right? And which I'm over-exaggerating, right? You didn't do that, but... Can we try that? Oh. Yeah. Already, it felt so much more you are now together, mm -hmm. right? And it was in tune, which is great. That extra bonus, right? right? And so I think any time that we attune, especially in, in, in front of a crowd, and you, you know, you got time crunch, and you, you know, it's, you, your heart race, your heart's going, this is a great way to look at each other, lock eyes, and go, we're here, right? And the audience will go, oh, they're there, right? <laughs> and then you go, boom, right? And it all ties into the idea of, remember, you're here together. You're here as a unit, and I think that's really important. So can we do that one more time, and then we can just start at the beginning really quickly? Yeah. And feel free to let me know on time and stuff. Better, a little closer, but I still am looking for a little bit more of that. Let that air really lead it. So continue to work on that as we go through. All right, let's go ahead, and I do kind of want to jump to where you do play. I have um, a different, th it's very similar. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of a different edition, so I might have some measure numbers off. But if we can just jump to maybe like a couple bars before you jump in. Yeah. So maybe where, uh, what is this? Uh, Let's do this measure here. I don't know exactly. Okay. It, you, you two can work out exactly where that. Yeah. Uh. Um, it's the fourth line you go. Come on. From C sharp to C sharp in the. This is one, two, three before the saxophone enters. Oh, that, that one works. Yes. Okay. <laughs> how much musicality you're putting into it there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of gestural things that is very evocative of the time as well something that I, and I know I'm, I'm somewhat limited on time so I just want to dive into the idea of using vibrato I think vibrato is such a very interesting topic because a lot there's a lot of different opinions on it a lot of different eras on when to use it when not to use it how to use it 
I like to be, um, I like to think of vibrato as a way to create tension or a way to create interest or a way to create movement or motion. And I use it relatively sparingly. Can you try this opening again? And I don't want you to use any vibrato. Can we try that? Uh, maybe we can just start right where you come in. Now, it sounds, uh, we still need to create some movement even without that vibrato rhyme. <laughs> so even though there's no vibrato, you can still do things musically to give us that feeling of movement, of saying something. So can we try it one more time? and? The, and instead of holding that C, just da, do something with it, okay. just not vibrato. Can we try it again? Vibrato can spin, right? So you're totally alone here. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it, mm -hmm. right? Which you were, but I want you to enjoy it even more. You can really let these moments of silence linger. Mm -hmm. The silence is so important. Mm -hmm. And so when you do da da do da da do da da do da 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 Right? You can really lean into these things, especially these chromatic passing tones. Piano, right? You can really lean into them and really, that way that when we get to one mm -hmm. with that piano and you can start using that vibrato, we're in this new color, we're in this new scene, we're in this new area. And so that is, again, leaning into this idea of being in these spaces. Um, I know I'm very limited on time, so can we just try two before one? Yeah. And play a little bit more? This moment here is so, for me, it is, this for me is when the piece starts, is like this little moment. Mm -hmm. This is the first time where like, we're walking through this imagery that you shared with us of this, the sun, uh, or actually, this, maybe this is before the sun is coming out. Maybe this is, the sun is coming up behind these mountains and you're still around this very blue, very uh, calm and still body of water. And at this cadence, or this arrival, is when you finally see the first signs of light, right? Mm -hmm. And so what a beautiful moment. And so, you know, you can make more of that um, and really be in that space so that when you get to that seemingly random moment, it is kind of a space that we can all join in together and really enjoy that. So can we try, um, where is that at? Let's do, Two bef yeah, let's just start at one. Let's just start at one. And if we can both think of that as we are arriving to that specific arrival, um, and I think you know exactly which spot I'm talking about. Yeah, once we get to that arrival, if we can set that up a little bit more, 
um, or even we have a day crescendo before it, prepare that a little bit more so that when we hit that, oh, yeah, let me try it one more time. still. It's cold. It's crisp, right? That was beautiful. That was lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, I'm going to move it on to Corey here in just a second. Um, that's our first forte. That's our first arrival, right? Yeah. Let's make that. Let's make make that moment. Um, and and in regards to like my last final like large comments is in general, this piece does not have a huge amount of fortes. Doesn't have a huge amount of large moments. So when they do happen, especially during the the ruckus, you know, uh, da, 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 da. exactly when you have like those heavy moments. Big, really big. This is depth, you know. This is the time where you can belt it out, and so be very, you know, sparing with your fortes. Um, and when you do have them, lean into them. Absolute pleasure to meet you both. Thank you again so much for performing with us. You Thank guys you sounded absolutely style. beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you again, Gabe. Erase all that. <laughs> All right, hi, hi. I'm Corey. Corey Great to meet you. you. Uh, amazing playing. Uh, it's a real pleasure to um, hear, hear this piece again. I played it um, several years back, but it's just um, Debussy, like you were saying. You know, he's, he, a lot of blues and a lot of yellows, yeah. uh, I certainly agree, and I think you're bringing them out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, Kyle was talking about how you can um, use uh, things like uh, vibrato, for example, and different variations on that to shape your phrase. Um, so um, another thing that, um, uh, another component you can use to um, develop your phrasing is uh, by thinking about um, uh, anchor points. And I, f I feel that Debussy in particular, particularly this piece, um, there's such rhythmic variety and um, a lot of kind of compositional techniques that he's using that really lend themselves to um, being expressed by um, delineating your phrases uh, in terms of where like your the, the strength of the phrase is and where like the weakness of the release of the phrase is. Um, so, uh, and it's real, like I said, like the um, the rhythmic variety. It's uh, it it offers you a lot of flexibility in where to make these things happen. So um, uh, if we could actually go from where you just left off, um, I think that was like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven. After rehearsal one, do you have rehearsal numbers? Is that yeah, just a, one. okay. Yeah, or the measure right after that. Yeah. So can we just play uh, from there and play out to the uh, end of that phrase? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, great, great. And I think, I think you're actually doing a, a really good job of what I was just saying. Um, so in terms of uh, anchor points, what, what are you thinking of in that phrase um, as where are you weighting your, uh, 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 these uh, strong points of, your, mm -hmm. of the line? Um, so one thing that Evan and I have talked about a lot is like downbeats, so mm -hmm. like huge anchor points. And so like one, like this piece goes a lot between like twos and threes and so the but it's always in like duple meter and so mm -hmm. the one and two are generally pretty strong so like in the start of that phrase it's like da 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 mm -hmm. those seem like really strong anchor points 
Yeah, yeah, and they definitely are. That rhythm really lends itself to that. And even the way that the, um, the, the whole four bars are shaped, right? Um, and you're, you, you brought that out really beautifully. Um, so let's uh, then play the next uh, entrance that you come in. We can start at rehearsal two. Um, and then just play uh, from, uh, you know, the first like eight, 12 bars of that, of that mm -hmm. section there. Great. So what would you say is uh, different about the way that these phrases are set up in comparison to the, uh, the last section just before that? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, I think the phrase before from you know, rehearsal one is very, um, I think it's more like downbeat, it's more like, um, like the phrases are like almost measure by measure, whereas with mm -hmm. two, it's almost like the phrase goes longer and it's like, uh, it's not just a one measure idea, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. the, everything is leading to the da, 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 and that like goes on to the next thing and the next thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so we've got we've got some longer phrases now, right? Um, and we've also got more um, we've got more articulate or different articulations here, right? We've got some staccatos, we got uh, some grace notes, we got some tenudos, and then uh, you know the iconic, but you know the thing that it's all leading to. Um, so, what's something that might be interesting about the articulations? In this, uh, in these phrases here. So we know we have longer phrases now, but um, how, what jumps out about the articulations, particularly in comparison to the section prior? Uh, it's definitely a lot more staccato, and um, uh, there's some articulations that are almost like remnant of like string playing, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the um, dotted uh, tie. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, it's like very like. It's um, it's just more precise in its articulation, I guess, in its certainly. Like instructions of how to play the phrase. Yeah, certainly. Um, you said it's more precise. I mean, there's more. Yeah, it's it's more finely kind of um, granulated. The um, the the articulations and how they're changing here. Um, so. Uh, you know, we were talking about how the str the strength of our um, phrases is like really on kind of downbeat, strong beats in this um, uh, in the you know few measures prior to rehearsal two. Um, where are those tenudos placed in the, um, the section that you just played? Are they still on downbeats? No, um, I'm seeing them on the, like the end of two. Right, right. So we we have. A, a section that is mostly staccatos, but in the few tenudos that we have, they're actually not on the downbeats. Right. And so this is a, um, a, a place where you can use that difference in articulation to bring out uh, maybe a different anchor point of where those phrases might be. Um, so instead of, right, instead of um, da 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 you could try da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, like so really saying, uh, um, really uh, bringing out the fact that this note is a tenudo and I am treating it specially because it is a tenudo in the context of these other staccatos that are happening. Yeah, and the fact that it's on, an, uh, on like a, um, a duple upbeat um, is that the rhythmic variety there lending itself to that um, change in articulation. So why don't you try that there from uh, after two? Try to really bring out um, the, uh, the tenudo not happening on the downbeat, but actually on the second duple and see how that changes your, the character. Cool, great. So just at two? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, 
if we're, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound like a, a trick question or a simple tr question, but uh, I guess what is the, the biggest difference between a tenuto and a staccato? Um, a staccato wants space. Uh -huh. Tenuto is more comfortable being a little bit closer. Okay, okay, I, I, I see what you're trying to say. Um, yeah, a, a staccato needs the space to be heard as a staccato, yeah. right? So by contrast, if you really want to bring out the tenutos, you have to also make the staccatos more staccato, right? right? And so um, if, you're, uh, uh, if we have a tenuto that's not happening on the downbeat, then your staccato note on that downbeat has got to be pretty, like we have to hear the yeah. space in between it. So dun dun dia, da, like mm -hmm. have a, a lift there so that you can really emphasize the tenuto. Oh. Dun dun dia, da, dun dun dia, da. Right? So try, try that, tr cool. that way. <laughs> Great, and that's that's a great um, uh, like the kind of the first level of setting up that differentiation. I would say the next level on top of that is um, putting a little more weight into the tenuto. So right now we've got um, we we've uh, delineated the the length uh, difference between these two notes, but now let's delineate the. Um, uh, like the anchor point kind of, uh, like the, the relative strength of these two notes in addition. So we've got a st staccato that's short, but also it's short and it's not quite as emphasized. And then we've got a tenuto that's long, but it also has more weight to it. So dun dun dian, da, dun dun dian, da. Like we, we really want to hear that tenuto as um, not just longer, but also more like more leaned on. What do you, what do you recommend like putting like a small crescendo on the tenuto or just using faster air? Or? Right, so that, I think that could be, um, that's like an our, 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 I mean all, the, all of these are artistic decisions, right? Um, but um, I think either of those, uh, uh, what, whatever you find works more comfortable for you, um, either of those are uh, certainly valid ways to bring out the weight in that that second to judo. So, and it's important that you're thinking um, about that. Like there's not, there's no one way to play this piece, obviously, but even in order to do, in order to bring out different characters and moods and phrases, there's no one way to do all those things either. So, you know, we're talking about um, uh, articulation differentiation and, uh, and strong and weak points, but there are many different ways to to implement those ideas. And so like one thing you said, you know, uh, sure you could crescendo through that uh, tenuto, you could use more, more air to begin with so that the tenuto has more of a presence, right? But either way, you're thinking about, uh, okay, what am I doing specifically to make this sound a certain way? And that's like the most important thing you, you need to be doing as a performer. Um, so great, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Two minutes? Okay, then there's, uh, let's move on to um, the section after, uh, okay, this is, actually, just before the Allegretto Scherzando. Okay. So, like, um, maybe four, five, eight, eight before the Allegretto? with the piano, um, da 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 yeah. yeah, let's play from there. I'm sorry, how many before the Sorry, eight before the Allegretto. Um, uh, so this is after rehearsal three, um, piano with the octaves, da 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 yeah. Thank you. 
So um, do you know what this um, uh, technique is called compositionally, right? So you've got, um, uh, and I'm talking about like your, the phrases that you play particularly, right? We went da da di, da da di, and then the allegretto starts and you have da da di, da da di, da da di. Right. Um, I may not know the exact term, but I'm like kind of playing like deep playing but in different rhythms mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, like da 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 da, just the same thing, just sped up. Yeah, it's the same thing sped up. So it's called um, uh, rhythmic diminution. Like the, the, sp the rhythm gets like smaller, right? Um, but <clears throat> um, a cool thing about this is uh, it, the rhythm gets smaller, but it's, it's the same pitches, mm -hmm. right? So we can really hear the relationship between those two things. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our anchor point idea, when you're playing the, the slower version, right? Um, how are you thinking? You've got these three notes. Um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that you're thinking of the first note as your strong, your, your really anchor note. Mm -hmm. But what about those other notes? Um, how would you categorize them like hierarchically in comparison to the first note? Mm -hmm. Like, are we like okay? The first one's strongest. Are we getting weaker, weaker? Are we getting like weaker and then stronger again? How are you? I guess about theoretically, that? it would be like strong, weak, strong, like like almost like a, a, a three-four thing where it's like strong, weak, kind of strong, mm -hmm. back to strong again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, I kind of I heard that uh, idea c coming across in the way that you were playing it. So like, di da di, like, and then really giving a little bit more emphasis on that. So I would say, um, you know, if we look at the um, the way that rhythm uh, gets crunched together in the uh, allegretto, the di da di di da di, right? Um, the um, it seems like the last note might actually be the weakest. Um, and I would say the in fact, we've also got a, a slur over the whole thing, like like right? We're, not, we're technically not supposed to re-articulate that last yeah. note. So if you're thinking of those two measures, mm -hmm. um, just like the, the first two measures where you have that, right, as one idea, if you think about that, you're, you're, you have to use more air to really connect the whole thing, uh, to make it have this strong, weak, and then weaker in relationship to the whole thing, right? right? So we want to think, D -I -E. mm -hmm. like so really, like you have to really lead the air through the lower note so that when you go up to the higher note, you have a little bit, um, you have something to, to um, create the sense of, of pulling away right. when you get there, rather than having to, oh, I'm changing notes, I gotta put a little more air into it. So try that for those, um, the four measures before the allegretto. Mm -hmm. Try and really make the, those two measures under the slur sound like one thing, where we're starting at the strongest point and that last note being like an afterthought as the end of that. Yeah, try that. <laughs> So, uh, so the the way that you did that four measures before Allegretto, that was exactly like what I was talking about, and I, I'm sure you could feel that too. It feels different to play. Um, I would say that concept is exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, but just smaller, right. crunched together, right? So d da e d da e d da e d da e, right? In terms of that hierarchy. So um, try from the Allegretto now. Um, that we, you want the, um, the, the strong beats mm -hmm. to still be the down beats and the, the highest note to still be like kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So kind of like thrown away. Like, de, da, e, de, da, e, de, da, e. Right, so tr try that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's... Um, uh, like we were saying with the, the staccato and the tenuto, how um, you know, we have to kind of de-emphasize one in order to emphasize the other, right? right? Um, in this case, we'll really have to emphasize those strong beats, di, da, e, and then the last note being 
uh, a little short so that we can get back into the D, like get, get more emphasis on that to differentiate them. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're sounding amazing on this, and um, these are just some things to think about as you continue working on it. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you so much for <laughs> Second movement of Fuzzy Bird Sonata by Takashi Yoshimatsu. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> Amazing playing. Um, so how long have you been working on this? Um, I worked on it for about three months for a state back in March, and then I kind of let it collect up, so I kind of picked it back up. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and did you, um, what, what made you choose this piece to play? Like, what, what do you, what speaks to you about this piece? Like, why do you like it? <laughs> this piece? And I get, I mean, you know, the piece as a whole, but, you know, in particular, the, um, this movement, too, if there's anything. Um, I don't know. Uh, I listen to a lot of, you know, you know, the classics, you know, the staples or the, the, you know, when you look for a saxophone repertoire, there's usually people that, or there's, there's pieces that you're told to play. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And I kind of did some research and. I like this one better than most of them, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, if, if you think about the second movement in particular, I feel like this, uh, Yoshimatsu's music is, um, is very distinctive. Yeah. And um, even the way that a lot of this is written, um, what, what makes it different than, than other pieces that, you know, like Iber or Creston or something like that? Um, there's not much of a, a tempo or a feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's mostly just, yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lot of... One big cadenza, kind of. Yeah, it's one big cadenza. There's a lot of rubato. Um, the, the music itself has got a lot of, like, Excel, retard. There's lots of, like, kind of weird-looking contemporary yeah. things where it's, like, um, you know, it's, it, it's basically... Um, uh, he's writing in a style that's... Um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Like par parlando, or it's kind of like talking, yeah. right? Where it's not necessarily always strictly in tempo, but it's conversational. Um, and there, there's a lot that you can do with that. You've got a lot of freedom. Um, I mean, you're a bird, and he's telling you to sing in this movement, so. <laughs> right? um, so, uh, you know, I think um, one of the things you can really do when you especially when you have a lot of these like feathered beam ideas yeah. so we, a beam that's starting small and then branching out into three or like starting as three and yeah. coming into one um to really uh bring across these um th these speeding ups and these slowing downs right um you want to think about having an extreme on either end and it's usually uh a better bet to start with being more extreme on the slower end so that you have more room to dig in to the the contour of the phrase and that you're not speeding up too fast or you're not like blowing through anything yeah. um so on the second line so this is like the second measure of the second line right um the the 13 tuplet <laughs> grouping right and followed by the 10 um so it's really just like a, a, a feathered beam that he said, Excel retard, yeah. different way of writing that. Um, can you play those two, that two, um, those two like beats there? So the, the grouping of the 13 and the 10, and can you just play it without any, any Excel or retard, just de da de da de, like just, just yeah. straight, the, the note straight. And so, uh, what would you say is the most important part of that idea? Where it switches? Really? Yeah, where the notes are changing. So the contour going down yeah. and coming back up. So try that again. Same speed, no, no tempo fluctuations, but really bringing out the descending and the ascending in relationship to the, that top note just staying the same. Okay, okay, good, good. So, so we're, it's almost like we have two voices, right? It's like there's a pedal at the top, and then we're bringing out this descending and then ascending. So um, now, adding in the feathered beam idea, I want you to start as slow as you just did, right? And then speed up 
know, a little bit, not too fast, but you, um, the, the main thing that you're aiming for is to preserve that contour. So you never want to get too fast that you're starting to lose it. Um, and it helps by, you know, starting off like dee da dee da dee da dee da dee da dee da Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so, uh, by the same token, on the on the back end of that, you you really want the retard to to retard, like to to differentiate that even more. So we're thinking in these extremes, ideas of extremes. Um, so try that from the fermata now before that. Um, and when you get to that excel and retard, right? D um, don't feel that you have to excel so fast right away, um, and that when you are retarding at the end, you're really pulling it back. Yeah, so, and, and you can, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can play around with how, how fast or slow that you want to go, um, but as long as you're thinking about where are my starting points and my ending points in terms of the tempo, and then what, what's the actual thing about, that I'm trying to say with this, and what we're really trying to hear is that descending uh, and ascending contour. With that, and so there's, you know, that idea in and of itself, it, it comes back in a lot of different forms yeah. throughout this, right? I think there's one, um, uh, uh, a couple parts where he has them notated as grace notes, yeah. right? Um, so I think, uh, where would that be? Like second page, fourth line, right? Yeah. So if there, uh, how might you think about interpreting this differently? the way that he's notated, right? So, so you've got the same like high pedal, but now the ascending contour line is grace notes, yeah. right? And those grace notes are each slurred into the top yeah. note rather than the whole thing being together. So how might you think about that differently than the, the, um, the phrase you just played on the first page? Um, the, the drum notes like more accented or it's the center of the, of the idea mm -hmm. and the, the notes that go up and down they like hug to it closer to it yeah yeah so it's like the hierarchy switched yeah. right so so now we've got the our, our pedal or drone at the top as being the voice that's strong and the ascending contour as just these little kind of blips going in there um, so try that try that there um, the same idea though with the um, with the speed, right? So we're thinking differently in terms of our hierarchy of, of voices, but also we want to do the same thing with um, the extremes in terms of our speed. So to really get that excel, right? Um, make, make sure you're not starting it too fast uh, so that you have space to go. Yeah, yeah so try that, again. Try that there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, awesome. I mean, I feel like this, um, you know, there's, uh, th this whole movement is really just a bunch of variations yeah. on that kind of idea, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're thinking about my, your extremes in terms of uh, the, the speed at which you're going, and then uh, the hierarchy of the voices that you're trying to bring out. Um, if you think about those two concepts, they apply throughout the entire movement, just in slightly different contexts. Um, so I think that would be um, a good starting point of uh, places to think about how you're shaping this movement music musically, um, especially when it's it's rubato, you know, it's 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 very free and like cadenza for like the whole movement. Um, it's really up to you to. Uh, give the movement its shape, and these are some things that you can do to um, to really solidify that. Yeah. 
Cool. So I'll pass it on to Bob now. Thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs> Could you remind me your name one more time? Isaiah. What was your name? Isaiah. Isaiah. Hi, I'm You're Bob awesome. Eason. Yeah. Cool. Beautiful. So, tell me about, you know, the Corey got into this a little bit, but tell me about the the character of this movement. It's um, kind of like grieving something, maybe. Okay. Or okay. It's, it's very it's very atmospheric, right? Yeah. Like it's it's not about, you know, the. It's not, it's not in the same kind of structure that a, a, another typical saxophone piece would be, right? It's very free. Um, and so I think every, every aspect of the way you play has to contribute to that in a really meaningful way. And so I think from the very beginning, I want you to be really aware of you know, your body as you play. So there's two things. I want to see if we can get two things kind of zeroed out from the very beginning. When you, I don't know if you know, but when you play, left shoulder's up like this, right? So, so try to just like, yeah, just be totally relaxed in your shoulders, okay? And, you know, uh, the way that we hold our instrument is obviously personal preference. Try to find just the most relaxed position you can. I like to let like my E-flat key guard kind of rest against my hip. Like I, normally I don't, I don't hold the instrument out too far, but just try to be as relaxed as you can. And then the second thing is that when you start, you don't need to necessarily show everybody when it's going to happen. When you played earlier, you, you, were, um, you were just very formal in, in that you went, Dum. but you could just sneak in. So try that. Take, you know, take your, still take your, really, your, your good breath, but then you don't need to necessarily tell us when you're going to start. Mm, so still, I saw your, your body kind of went. Yeah. Okay, yeah, beautiful. I think the next thing is that we can really dig into this pianissimo world. Okay, we've got pianissimo and then we've got a lot of stuff but all of it is beginning at pianissimo with this crescendo, right? So. Let's start at a true pianissimo. And this, this is a wonderful room for us to do this in because it's very live. When you play, it just instantly goes. So draw them in to you. Make them listen to you. Continue. Uh, no, 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 too much, too much. So too much? Let's, let's take this to heart. The, 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 penis, uh, the penisimo you started at was beautiful. You brought it up just a little bit. Let's just leave it there. We've got the whole, the whole rest of the piece to get into it. Yeah, beautiful. I thought that, just in terms of just the line itself, was very evocative of, you know, it, like you could hear a bird in the distance. Um, I think we have a lot of decisions to make about how we do the grace notes and kind of, you know, what effect we want them to have. I don't think they necessarily need to be a super, like a blatant or like, a, like an, an elbow jab. They can just be more of a murmuring, you know. So I think the same thing. It's it's introspective, even with the grace notes. Okay, try one more time, and let's keep going this time.
Yeah, so if, if that's like our absolute baseline and you want to like sprinkle like a little extra like extra something something on top of it, I think that's beautiful. But I think, you know, we can really honor the, the dynamics of composer row by starting there. Um, and sure, you know, add add to Nuno's here and there and and bring out the extra stuff you want to bring out. I got a man. Thank you. Um, but I think that sets the stage to just be really calm. Um, and when we've got these really big leaps in the grace notes, like, he, like from here, so we have B, F sharp, right? Can you just play those, those two notes out of context, just B, um, Yeah, one more time. So when, when you go to start the grace note, sometimes I hear a, a really loud pop of the tongue. Um, that's a whole different conversation. Um, uh, but I want you to use way, way less tongue, way more air. Okay. So the, I want, what I want you to try to do is to maybe start the air a little sooner and aim for the F-sharp rather than the B. Mm -hmm. Okay, that one was really nice. Now back up one note. So now we just start on the F-sharp. Yeah, I think if you can keep it relatively smooth and connected like that, I think that's really effective. Um, as, as I was listening to you play this earlier, sometimes the grace notes were just really outside of the texture. Um, and you know, part of that I think is just you know, when we see grace notes, we think, oh, that's a really fast thing, but it doesn't necessarily have to jump out quite so much. Um, yeah, beautiful. I think uh, let's, let's see, let's keep going. Um, actually, I wanted to jump ahead just a little bit. Can we start at here? Very nice. So I have one, uh, maybe a couple, couple of questions. How come you're breaking here? Um, I've heard recordings of Nobu Yusagawa. I don't know, I think there's two of them. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more than two, but sure. some of them he does, some of them he does. Okay, I think, um, I think if you're going to break, the gesture needs to still be in motion. Because we have one big overarching slur that goes from here all the way to here, right? So if you're going to break, the momentum has to be such that it's continuing. Um, you know, okay? Yeah. Mm, but this is, this one, this one's forte. Is that the first forte we've got? Yeah. Yeah, man, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you can, you can repeat a couple more times. Okay. Um, enough to really build up this idea that we're going to kind of launch into the next figure from that repeated idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And when we get to this fermata note at B, you can hang out a little bit longer so that the, the last little bit is almost like an afterthought. You know, be da 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 One more time from here. Yeah. Beautiful. So I think as you're working on this piece, try to have a couple of things in mind. The first is that we want to use what the composer gave us as like kind of the, the baseline structure. So it could be dynamics. It could, it could even be repeat like exactly this number of times. Yeah. It could just be that, you know, trying to see like what does this big slur actually mean? But 
try to use all the information that, that you have to then take and make your own. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is I think you can, you can have maybe more of an arc in the, the um, a performance of this movement. Where is like the biggest point? Right. Yeah, right, the big the kind of gnarly altissimo thing. Uh, I think you can build up a lot more to it. Like each of these fortes we have, so one, two, three, four, those are all different, right? If we, if we really think about the, how we utilize the dynamics on a page, particularly for you know, a 20th century work, um, the first forte may be here, the second one may be here, the third one may be a little bit lower. So I think you know, however you kind of start to look at the, the big picture of this movement, try to think, uh, you know, Corey was talking about the hierarchy of like, you know, when we have different lines. Dynamics also have their own kind of internal hierarchy. Like if, if this is the biggest point, we gotta think, how do we get from pianissimo to there in a way that's, you know, really thoughtful? Yeah. Okay, but yeah, excellent job. Um, it was really a pleasure to hear you play. Thank you.